Employees worker organizing panel? Yes? Yes? So, uh, my name is Jonathan Weston. I'm the director of New York Communities for Change. Um, we're working on many low wage worker campaigns, including fast food, supermarkets, car washes. Come on up. Uh, we've also organized home daycare providers as well, too. Um, so, uh, let me actually introduce our panels, panelists. Um, and why don't, as I introduce you guys, you give kind of a, a five to ten minute uh, rundown of your work that you're doing and the current campaigns that you're working on. Uh, and then we'll get into kind of, a, I think, a broader discussion around this new type of organizing that's happening out there and, um, you know, how to, how to move it, how we're partnering with labor, how we're doing lots of different things. Um, so, uh, first uh, on the end is Deb Axe. She's the executive director of Make the Road New York. Um, they are engaging in low-wage low organizing campaigns and car washes and organizing lots of innovative um, policy and legal analysis of uh, different, uh, in different handles we're trying to use and mobilize to organize more low-wage workers in various industries. So. Deb. Yes. Okay. Um, hi, so I'm Deb Axe from Make the Road. Um, I mean, our model, we work out of a, a broad based community organization, right? A membership base of around 12,000 largely Latino, um, low wage folks um, in New York City and Long Island. And our model has long included multi sector committees of low wage workers. Right? Our organizing model is one that's committee based around different standing issue areas, so LGBTQ rights to housing, to youth power, to immigrant power, right? um, to, to name a few, and so workers' rights has been one of them. And then out of our low-wage worker committees, um, which I mentioned are multi-sector, we run lots of campaigns, right? Small campaigns um, that are predominantly about leadership development for new workers coming in, sort of building their role, um, taking on one employer or a few employers in sort of a, a small fight, which often is around wage theft, um, and often with our organizing team, partnering with our litigation team. Um, we've done a lot of policy work, um, you know, one of our, our big signature campaigns was passing the Wage Theft Prevention Act um, and doing a lot of work around um, improving, um, increasing penalties and improving enforcement of wage theft protections um, in New York State. And then we also do a lot of government agency monitoring. So like the really unsexy nitty gritty sort of like tracking individual cases in the hundreds through the Department of Labor so that we can observe all of the shitty ways that, that cases get stalled out and mishandled um, and then weigh in to sort of improve the processes um, be, with the enforcement agencies who are really, you know, the, the one place that the workers who never walk through any of our doors, right, will be going to, to help get back up in enforcing their rights. Um, and then the, you know, the, the newer sort of uh, campaigns that we're really investing in now, much more sector-based, so car wash organizing being, being one of the big ones um, and other things that we're developing largely with New York Communities for Change as well. Um, doing low-wage organizing where the goal is to get something like union contracts, right? So in car wash, definitely is like a, a collective bargaining agreement is sort of the end game. Um, the model being really community-based um, organizing of workers, partnership between the labor union and the community organizers to make that happen. So that's sort of the, the basic background. Okay. Is that good? Sure. <laughs> so next, uh, sitting next to Deb is uh, Daisy Chung, who is the director of Rock New York, uh, which is an organization organizing restaurant workers uh, all over New York State. Uh, they're part of also a national federation um, that organizes restaurant workers nationally. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about your guys' model and what you guys are up to? Sure. How's everybody doing? Good. Yeah. Okay. All right, has anybody here worked in the restaurant industry? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so, you know, the restaurant industry employs large numbers of people across the country. Approximately 10 million people work in um, the restaurant industry. 
And here in New York, um, there's about over 600,000 restaurant workers just in New York State. Wow. So it's a huge, huge industry. Um, but you know, as, as the industry has been growing, um, you know, there's you know huge boost in sales and profits, and yet working conditions have remained the same. Um, and so, what are those conditions like? Um, you know, wages have pretty much stagnated over the last over 20 years, really, and has remained the same. Um, workers, so workers are facing you know extremely low wages. Um, they also, the, I mean, the industry is kind of lacks any sort of benefit, really. Um, you know, that's pretty much across the board. And also, um, advancement opportunities um, are really not there. So you have someone who's been working as a dishwasher, and he's a dishwasher for the next 10 years. Right? Um, so very, very little um, career mobility within the industry. So kind of like just in, in broad strokes, those are some of the challenges um, facing uh, restaurant workers. And so, you know, just to briefly talk about our model, um, you know, we essentially want to improve, raise wages and improve working conditions across the industry. And so we do that in three, um, three ways. One is the direct workplace um, organizing that we do with restaurant workers who come to us around violations of their, their rights in the workplace. So that you know, can range from uh, wage theft to discrimination and um, things of that nature. And so they come to us in health, health and safety violations. And so they come to us and we you know, help them organize <laughs> in the workplace. And you know, so we use a kind of both litigation and um, public pressure um, to you know, get restaurant owners to comply. And then the second way that we, you know, we try to create change within the industry is through um, worker-led research and policy work. And so, you know, we've conducted um, so far just in New York um, five research studies around the industry that cover um, just kind of what the over, oh, you know, what the overall conditions are like, but also around um, discrimination. So we've actually done a pretty massive study on um, discrimination and its impact on, on the industry. So, you know, people are being relegated or pigeonholed, right, to very specific positions depending on their race and their gender. And then, um, and then in terms of policy work, we've worked on things like, you know, increasing the minimum wage, um, paid sick days, um, and uh, right now we're actually working on a liquor licensing campaign um, on a statewide level. And then the third way that we um, try to produce change is to actually engage employers and consumers. And so we call this our high road program, and we engage employers that are actually thinking about you know, implementing ethical um, workplace practices within their establishments. And so we engage them in what we call a round table and bring them together to talk about their best practices. Also disseminate that information to their peers um, so that they can also um, implement them. And um, as well as consumers. So consumers are also part of our round table to really kind of spread the word um, that that you know, consumers actually care about workers in this industry and care about um, uh, working conditions. So that's kind of in broad strokes our um, organizing. Great. Um, and last but not least, uh, Camille Rivera. She's the executive director of United New York. Uh, she is running, um, you know, uh, a coalitional campaign of. Um, bringing labor unions and community organizations together to elevate low-wage campaigns across New York City. Um, yeah. um, so, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be on a panel with um, friends who and, and colleagues who really are real Ooh, true wow. believers. I'm sorry, I have a cold, so you're going to just bear with me. Um, who are like true believers of the movement around elevating the voices of low-wage workers. So it's really a pleasure and it's actually good to see so many people here who are interested in how we actually continue to build that movement. Um, so, um, as uh, Jonathan um, said, I, I run a coalitional organization which is different from the people on this panel and the moderator here. Um, I do, uh, my goal or our goal, uh, the United New York goal, um, was based off of a project um, kind of helped underwritten and, and around uh, of the fight for fair economy 
um, and the Service Employees International Union. As you all know, like two or three years ago, there was a tremendous um, pushback from the right around um, the fact that low-wage workers, workers in general, middle-class workers, were all responsible for the flights of our, the flight of our economy. And it was getting away from the fact that the banks were actually very much responsible for this. And so there was a need nationally to create a, uh, create a number of organizations to be able to combat that. Um, but at the same time, what you had been seeing over the last 10 years was a shift, uh, or rather a gap between uh, community-based organizations and labor. And while community organizations and labor had worked together, obviously hand in hand, they were very they were very project-based um, and not necessarily sustainable-based um, campaigning. And so the model within the Fight for Fair Economy and United New York was to do two things. One was to create, uh, to actually elevate the faces of what was really, uh, the faces of people who were really suffering during the economy. How do we actually get people to start thinking about that the only way forward is one, to actually raise uh, wages for workers and not necessarily cut back, but to give out more and to hold corporations and owners and employers responsible for that, uh, for that accountability. Um, but also to create a new model where there's a space for community organizations and labor to actually work together um, for good or for bad, right? Figuring out that model, working about how do we actually, while, for example, uh, you know, labor organizations are um, organizing workers on the ground, how do we actually talk to them in the communities in which they live and the community organizations which are in those areas, for example, Make the Road and, and um, New York Communities for Change. And so we partnered with those organizations to begin creating spokespeople and organizing rapid response actions against banks, against um, employers, um, and kind of found a space around the low wage model um, as, we, as we started organizing our work. And the way that we realized, what we realized was that the only thread that many people had and the only relationship that many people had wasn't necessarily on like a you know a banks campaign or you know let's hit David David Koch or whatever. It was actually about the fact that many people were organizing low wage workers in the city. And so what we said was in our little world what we should do is actually thread a model around, okay, if Make the Road in New York Communities for Change are working with RWDSU to organize car wash workers and local 32 BJ is working towards organizing airport workers in Southeast Queens, why don't we actually put all these faces together and actually start moving a campaign around the fact that there's the haves and the have-nots and actually create points of escalation where, where people will still keep their own strategy, nobody's really sharing strategy on how they win, but that collectively we're working together um, to organize actions and events um, that would actually bring noise to the subject and actually take, put labor behind that and actually put the workers and the community organizers out there first. And we tried that model about, I would say, 18 months ago maybe and organized a small event where we actually just like threw it all together. It was kind of the silliest event. We did like a, a bus tour where we uh, um, had uh, the Teamsters who were, uh, I think, locked out of, of Southern universities, <coughs> I believe, and then there was um, the car wash workers, the grocery store, and, and the airports, and we just did a bus tour. Um, and what we found was that the press actually did it and, and the, the media actually couldn't tell the difference around like what type of worker it was because everybody's always worried about, well, the Teamsters make higher, higher wages and CWA makes a little bit less than that, but car wash workers make you know, four bucks an hour plus tips. Nobody cared about that. What they did care about was the fact that there was this level where employers were actually abusing their workers um, and making more profits than what they needed to. Um, at the expense of the workers. <coughs> and that storyline started to shift the storyline in New York City. Um, and so we began creating opportunities. So for example, I don't know if many people can remember the Con Ed strikes in July 24th. We were able to create a coalition of, I would say, of 100 groups um, that could work uh, organizations of cl clergy, um, labor organizations, community organizations, you know, Occupy at that moment. Rock, for example, um, all these different groups that had one goal in mind, and that was actually to put their voices out there. And we were able to shift during that period, that week of July 24th, and probably the week before that, a major uh, shift in how um, reporters and media actually viewed work, low wage workers. Um, and it just kind of exploded. Um, and so our model really is creating a space and a table where people work together. Um, putting workers out there um, hand in hand, creating worker exchanges where workers actually talk to other workers who are in the same type of fight, um, and then working towards elevating those fights and supporting those um, organizing campaigns on the ground. 
So for example, after the 24th, we moved into the fast food strikes and have been supporting the fast food worker organizing. Um, we've been trying to create a, a long-term clergy model with organizations like the NYCC and Black Institute about how do we actually create a model where clergy can be actively engaged on low-wage campaigns, but not necessarily just like a portion of the campaign, but how do they actually play a long-term role. Um, so that's kind of what we do um, in our organizing and our, in our model. Um, and it's actually the only way we're able to do it is with the community organizations that we work collectively with on those fights. Okay. So, um, and just real quick about my seminar organization. Uh, we partner a lot with Make the Road. I mean, low edge organizing campaigns would be the one that I'll just highlight that um, we're not partnering together. The NYCC is driving is um, the fast food worker organizing. We are organizing uh, thousands of fast food workers in the fast food industry in New York um, with the full intent of um, you know, winning living wages and trying to win contracts in fast food restaurants. No fast food restaurant in the United States of America is unionized. Um, and this is for the entirety of the fast food industry. So, you know, I mean, it's a very uphill battle. Um, we're approaching it as a community organization, um, but also I think in, in, uh, in a sense of not just doing the same things as normal. And you know, what we did in November, we took 200 workers out on strike um, at 30 different fast food restaurants that kicked off the campaign and folks saw it. And then uh, this April, uh, we took another 400 workers out on strike and it you know, was part of a national um, trend of cities across this country where fast food workers were going out on strike. Um, so we've been helping drive that campaign here. Um, and I think we'll talk a bit more about each of the individual campaigns where, you know, throughout the panel. So let me just start with, does anyone here work for a labor union? What union you work for? 1199 SEI. All right. The nurses are supposed to be Great, you guys are doing great stuff. Path. Path? Public Employees Federation. Part time CWA. All right, cool. So, um, for those of you that do work for the labor unions, I, I do not mean to offend you, but. But. I think uh, the interesting part about this conversation for me is that, you know, how do we expand our thinking about organizing workers? Because um, over the past 50 years, labor has declined heavily, um, not only in the public sector, but in the private sector especially. There, we're literally at 6% representation in this country of labor unions. And we're on the verge of becoming close to 0%. And I think that's kind of the, the, the premise behind what I would like to actually focus on today is kind of, you know, how we think differently and creatively about organizing workers in this city, but also, I mean, in the state, but also in this country. Um, how do we do it differently? How do we think outside the box? How do we partner with labor in different ways than we ever have? Um, and how do we really um, begin to change um, this, this trend of, you know, putting unionized workers in, um, you, know, be, you know, becoming obsolete. So I, I, I think with, uh, you know, kind of the state of where labor trends are heading, you know, I guess my first question for the folks on the panel would be, um, you know, kind of, one, how, are, how is this any different than what typical labor um, organizing drives have looked at NLRB elections, et cetera, et cetera. How is this different than the normal um, campaigns that have been run? And two, you know, kind of what has your relationship been with labor on many of these things? So I don't know who wants to start off. And, uh, yeah, make Daisy go first. Daisy. <laughs> Lots of peer pressure. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> um, okay, so I will, I guess, you know, I'll address that first. Um, so essentially, 
um, our model, you know, obviously the end um, goal of our, our workplace justice fights are not union contracts, right? So we don't seek to collectively bargain with the employer. Um, what we do do is to um, enter into settlement agreements, right? So like I had mentioned before, you know, workers come to us about um, labor violations in their workplace, and so there is a litigation so at the end, you know, um, in the settlement agreements, you know, what we really look for in, um, in, in our campaigns is not just the monetary, right, gains, even though that's very, very important, right? I mean, you know, workers who've literally been stolen from, right? I mean, it's like highway robbery, um, what's happening in these workplaces. But, you know, we're looking beyond, right, the, the kind of back wages and discrimination payments. It's really about what kind of broad policy changes can we implement in these restaurants, right, through these agreements, right? So a lot of workers have different grievances, right? Um, you know, whether they, they work in the kitchen or in the front, um, but they do have, you know, shared grievances around, you know, like I said, like, you know, there's, you know, low wages, there's little to no benefits, um, very little advancement opportunities. So, uh, you know, a lot of the kind of same things come up in each campaign, right? And so things that we've been able to win in these settlement agreements have been everything from like raises to grievance procedures to um, anti-discrimination um, training for management uh, to um, paid sick days, paid vacation time. So a lot of different uh, policies, right, that will kind of go beyond, right, just like payment, right? So a lot of, a lot of, you know, employers in this industry, you know, have, you know, they, they know, right? They, they, they anticipate lawsuits, right? So this is, you know, we really want to see, like, how can we improve this workplace, right, beyond someone paying money, right, to say, okay, okay, no, I want to, you know, I want to settle this score. So, you know, that's been a little bit different. But we do work with labor unions, you know, a lot, you know, um, they've been, you know, close allies to us in um, a lot of different campaigns, you know, including the workplace justice campaigns, but also policy campaigns. Um, we also work with unions on a coalition of food uh, worker organizations called the Food Chain Workers Alliance. And so, you know, we do have partnerships, right? But our model is very different, um, the end, goal is different, but you know, I think there's, you know, there's, there's pros and cons um, about, you know, each model, but I think we've, we've really tried to see how can we adapt to the realities of what's happening in, in this industry. Just a question, in, in restaurants where you guys have organized and won settlements, and et cetera, has that any time ever led to like a union contract or anything like that? And, um, how has that played out and how has like maybe someone like HERE or other folks that are organizing in restaurants, um, what has been their take in view? Yeah, so as you know, there, there hasn't been any organizing campaigns, um, union organizing campaigns in the restaurants that we've organized. Um, you know, I know that, you know, there's, there's been a lot of focus on um, the institutional food service organizing um, that, you know, that has really focused on over, over, over a decade. Um, and so, you know, for us, it's, you know, we're, you know, we're going to continue organizing workers, you know, if a union wants to organize these workers afterwards, um, you know, that's, you know, um, that's, that's up to them, but, you know, um, but as far as uh, our old workplace justice campaign. Um, do, do you want to have a quick question for Daisy? Uh, otherwise, I'm going to open it up for questions uh, later. But did you have something quick for Daisy? Okay, it's very quick, but we can make it Okay, cool. So, Deb, do you want to talk about uh, Make Their Own and the model, which is actually uh, probably a lot of what Deb's going to say is what NYCC, you know, uh, our model is too, because we kind of help build this yes, model together. Whatever, whatever I'm missing. I mean, I, so. You know, part of McDonald, obviously, as I described sort of in my introduction, is like our workers' committees are largely like worker center, right? Lots, lots of these waste up campaigns and stuff like that. So we have stolen as many good ideas as we could from Rock over the years, right? And like done some of that in terms of like building enforce enforceable agreements. But the stuff that I'm going to talk about is really about our current partnerships with labor 
in an effort to really build uh, you know, permanent low-wage worker organization within specific sectors and with specific industries, looking a little bit more like a traditional union. Now, that said, I mean, our car wash campaign, as I mentioned, we actually are, you know, we're working to get a, an industry-wide agreement across car washes. You know, we've got two contracts in place right now. So to some extent, it's a very traditional model. Some of the other campaigns, you know, that we're cooking up and, and sort of experimenting with right now are looking less like that, right? And more like potentially a minority union in a big industry um, and where the, the path to victory is, is less traditional. Um, but I think in both of them, there's both of those types of campaigns, there's really common elements, right? So it's about doing the work of organizing out of robust community-based organizations, right? Which gives us a few helpful um, advantages, right? And we're doing this in deep partnerships with unions, right? This is not like us saying, we don't think the unions get it, we've figured it out, right? So like in the car wash stuff, it's a really deep and intentional partnership with the RWDSU, who and my sister and make the road have partnered with for many, many years. So there's a lot of deep trust there, right? Then there's obviously the fast food stuff is with SEIU, we're doing some work with CWA, and we're talking to some other folks um, about uh, doing some of this work together. And I mean, some of the, the sort of core elements that we think we're able to bring to the table, right? Some of it is just about a movement building angle on organizing, right? And part of it that it's easier for a make the road or an NYCC organizer organizing workers to then respond to the question, well, what do you guys think of this union? Like, what's the story with this union that is part of this campaign? And our organizers can immediately just say, yeah, they're good. They're in it for the right reasons. Like, we're building this together. We got your back too, right? So some of the like moment of tension and doubt about who this union is, are they in it for the right reasons, and stuff like that is is obviously you know ameliorated. Um, you know, we're able to really throw down on like policy and political angles um, on the campaigns in a way that, that adds new dimensions, right? And so, you know, obviously our union allies are really innovative and creative in, and have great political allies and political partnerships. On the other hand, there's something different about being able to go to, you know, Julissa Ferreras in Queens, our city council person, and say, we live in your district, right? We're members of Make the Road and NYCC, we live in your district, and some of us are car wash workers, and some of us are neighbors and family members of car wash workers, and we need you to invest in our campaign to improve the car wash industry. But that's just a different kind of conversation than a union who endorsed Julissa saying, we need you to help us out, right? And so we're able to like bring some real meat and depth to that relationship, and she's able to come in and to help mediate, help bring car wash owners to the table, right? Help drive legislation through the city council that helps frame up um, the, the whole campaign, right, help call on the city to pull contracts from car wash owners who won't sit down at the table, you know, sort of that piece. Um, and then those same neighbors, those same family members, those same supporters, right, of the car wash workers, or of the supermarket workers, right, are out in the streets with the workers. So we're talking about direct action, lots of strikes, right, fast food obviously has been super, um, has really done a great job of, of elevating the strikes. It's like car wash workers across the city, undocumented workers are walking off the job, right? They're winning strikes, some in a day, some in an hour, some in 13 weeks, right? But for them to walk off the job um, is so much about them having the neighborhood support, right? Them having make their own NYCC at their back, right? It's not just a union fight to them. It's very much like, this is my family, this is my neighborhood, this is my community, and we're all standing up to demand that our government to help us get dignified jobs and we're standing up to demand that our bosses finally treat us like something other than animals. Um, you know, so I think those are just like a couple of pieces. I mean, another thing that we could talk about later if we want to, I mean, Make the Road, of course, um, one of our, our big things is like our, our legal team and sort of our policy work on it. Um, and so I think we've all been um, playing around with, with, you know, how we push policy campaigns that, that help to frame up the um, the organizing, so like we have the Car Wash Accountability Act and that campaign that we're pushing forward. Um, and I think we've also just really found that um, driving the sector-specific, workplace-specific organizing simultaneous to policy fights, like the minimum wage fight, the paid sick fight, right now, um, hopefully a local living wage fight, and like wage theft fights, really there's a lot of cross-pollination. Um, it helps to just get, like, jumpstart both. 
um, and that it really just, like things were able to explode over the last year because we had real active militant organizing fights going on in workplaces um, that were connecting the same people to fights on the policy front at the same time. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I think for Camille, just, I, Camille comes out with more of a traditional union background. Maybe you could talk a bit about now being in kind of the community, worker center-ish, coalition building world, uh, the different experience it is and the added value um, there is there for the labor movement and what, you know, how your views may have changed over the past, you know, three years of running your organization? <laughs> he wants to know if I've been brainwashed. Um, no. Um, no, no. Um, so I think, um, I think that is correct. I came from, um, my background is definitely um, from running from, uh, I was a, I worked for the New York Public Interest Research Group and then I immediately went into 32BJ um, working as in their political department for close to almost six years and then uh, started running um, United New York in coalition with all those community organizations. Um, I think um, I can definitely talk about the push and pull of creative, of, of how this space has allowed for more creative organizing. Um, I think that it is a rule of thumb in labor organizing to stick to the model um, that you know best of how to organize workers and every single labor organization has a various model that they use to go in and talk to workers and get them to get the contract that they need or deserve. Um, I think that one of the best opportunities um, of, of the <coughs> idea of United New York and, and our ability to work with all the different community organizations is to actually push the boundaries of creative organizing to a place where I actually have kind of evolved from what is the everyday work, uh, the kind of the, the stricter model versus, okay, what can we do outside the box to actually get workers more engaged? And one of them obviously is engaging community organizations to actually do a lot of that organizing and have the conversations that they understand. So that's number one. Um, and then number two, how do we use different tactics um, to push the owner and use that leverage to get the uh, to get labor organizations to a place of comfortability, right? So it's in these spaces, for example, that we said, well, you know what? Um, instead of, of organizing a regular strike vote, what if we did a strike vote where community and clergy actually ask workers to strike to go out there and strike um, um, their workplaces? Or instead of organizing just a regular candle like vigil, why don't we actually sit at the car washes until like some owner comes out and says, okay, like I want to talk? Or you know, it's, it's not necessarily the models that we're all using, but it is kind of like a, a space where unions are and labor organizations aren't necessarily like really open to doing that, right? There's lawyers, there's protections. They have to protect the organization. They have to protect the members that they that currently exist for them where we actually have the space to actually push the boundary, hit the owners where it hurts. And I think if there's a, a real opportunity there um, where we are pushing people to be more creative and more out there um, and pushing organizations. And I think la the labor organizations really feel like this is the model that they need in order to survive. Um, when the just, I, I don't know how many people here were, during, were around during the Justice for Janitors fights. Does people remember Justice for Janitors campaign? Where okay, where private sectors were looking, were, were organizing um, just um, janitors um, all across the country, but it was then that they were taking over bridges. They were um, going out there and like you know going through the buildings, shutting the buildings down. I mean, it was at that moment where there was a whole new model that came up there that people were saying, oh, this works because your your regular march is not necessarily working right now. Your regular you know um, opportunity to have a discussion with the owner is not working right now. The only thing that's going to work and shake things up is to be more and more aggressive. And I think we're getting there, and I think we're getting labor organizations to actually think that way. I know it's definitely always, I'm, I come from a more pragmatic background, and so coming into this world, actually saying, okay, actually, no, I'm going to actually go and I'm going to get arrested alongside these workers because they deserve it, is actually something that I think um, labor organizations are starting to really think about um, when um, thinking about the model. And I think that's what's really, what's great about uh, new creative organizing and, and new opportunities with community organizations. So, um, did you have a quick question? I, I was gonna do questions at the end. I actually have only like one more question for the panels, but. I was just gonna direct my question and uh, I, I know that uh, the lady in the middle, she does a lot of work with uh, restaurants. Now, I know in New York City a lot of 
people that work in restaurants are undocumented. I know this because my family is undocumented and works in restaurants. So we can't afford to get arrested. We can't afford to do these kinds of um, political actions. And at the same time, workers are being exploited. What do you do in that situation? So before maybe Daisy, I think you respond. It was that's actually part of, I think the uh, the second question I was going to just pose to um, the panel, which is, has to do with, you know, as as kind of the U.S. economy becomes more and more service sector economy. I mean, all of our manufacturing jobs, et cetera, are being shipped overseas, and um, I mean, we could have a whole conversation about how and where uh, the jobs are becoming overseas, but also I think with what we find here is that in the U.S., what we get left with is service sector jobs. And the overwhelming majority of service sector jobs are becoming minimum wage jobs. I mean, even from you know fast food workers, but also to people like bank tellers and bankers, right? They're actually becoming very low paid, very low wage jobs in many cases where they were high paying, pension, whatever jobs um, within the private sector. So, you know, again, I think one, and looking at kind of the, the population of folks that we're organizing, I mean, maybe folks could talk about <coughs> how different this type of organizing is in terms of the actual workers that we're targeting, um, including undocumented folks which is a very big piece of not only, I think, the restaurant worker organizing, but the car wash organizing, et cetera, that there's a, a lot of folks that are organizing that weren't typically engaged, um, that now are and are actually winning. Um, so maybe folks could talk about the, the different types of workers and um, experiences and backgrounds that folks are organizing. And then, um, two, I think, you know, maybe talking about how the industries that you know you're organizing in, um, and kind of their role and the, the broader fights for better wages, um, you know, be it through some of the paid sick days, um, and away stuff and things like that. So um, maybe if you want to start again, things. Oh boy, I'm on the hot seat. <laughs> um, okay, so just to address, how do I? Um, okay, so I think a good, you know, so I'll address the undocumented um, worker issue maybe at the, um, at the end of what I'm about to say. So I think, you know, one um, big contrast is, for example, like the fast food fight, right? So, you know, definitely in this like food service industry, what we're currently, you know, and what we've, you know, the, the types of establishments that we have been organizing and still are is generally around kind of high-end um, fine dining. You know, so it's kind of like the direct, like, you know, kind of opposite, right? You have like the fast food workers here and then you have like, <coughs> um, but it doesn't mean that the working conditions aren't um, similar, right? That there aren't a lot of similarities even though there's, you know, they're kind of at the end of each spectrum. And so like, for example, the current campaign that we're working on actually involves uh, um, Darden, and I don't know if you guys ever heard of Darden restaurants, but they own you know brands such as Olive Garden, Red Lobster, Longhorn Steakhouse, and we're actually organizing um, workers at the Capitol Grill, which is kind of like their high, like their really fine, fine dining um, steakhouse. Right? And so this is a, actually a national campaign, and just to kind of illustrate, you know, like you know the, the restaurant industry is actually really diverse. Right? So people would be like, what are you talking, why are you talking about discrimination? There's not discrimination, there's like all sorts of people working in here, right? But it's the occupational segregation that's occurring within the industry that's really problematic. So you have Darden, right, where the CEO, you know, makes, you know, I think his annual salary is about $8 million a year. And he also has all these benefits that are about, you know, like in stocks and things like that that are worth like $22 million, right? This is annual what this, this person makes. And then you have in, this, in the Capitol Grill in New York City, the, the location that we're organizing is on 42nd Street. It's like 
the highest grossing capital girl in the country. And their dishwashers are making $8 an hour. Right? Um, so like this huge contrast. And who are these, who are these dishwashers, right? They're immigrant workers, right? They're immigrant workers that are, you know, they're, all their dishwashers are immigrant workers. Right? And then you kind of like look in the, you know, you walk to the front, you know, well, you're not really walking into the kitchen, right? But you, you walk into that restaurant and who's in the front, right? And these, most of these fine dining establishments, they are white men. White men are the majority of servers in fine dining restaurants, which is very different, right? So like you go to like an Applebee's or a very casual, you know, establishment, it's actually women, right? It's women where um, wages are a lot lower, you know, because tips are supposed to be part of your wages. And so, you know, we do have a wide spectrum of workers that we're organizing. And it poses, you know, presents challenges too, right? Because you have, you know, workers coming from very um, different places. And so, you know, in terms of the um, undocumented um, worker issue, I think that's why we need allies, right? And allies can be everything from other organizations to unions to consumers, right? And so some of the kind of, you know, more... I don't know, I guess you want to call it riskier, right? Riskier um, tactics or, you know, actions that we want to do is that may not necessarily involve the workers themselves, right? You know, workers might, you know, kind of do, you know, do different actions, right? Everybody kind of has a different role with it, you know, to play, um, to really push the industry um, to do better, right? Um, and so, and I think, you know, in terms of undocumented workers, we've actually had, you know, you know, kind of people always ask about like, oh, well, what do you do about the fear factor? And, you know, that's very much present and, you know, we shouldn't, you know, discount that. But actually, undocumented workers have been one of the fiercest, boldest um, people in our campaigns. Like, just incredibly, incredibly bold and brave. Um, and so, you know, I definitely want that to also, you know, um, people to take away um, from that. But in terms of, you know, the industry itself, you know, I think it's, you know, we, we do need to um, take into consideration, for example, the National Restaurant Association. I mean, talking about, you know, different, you know, policies, right, that are in play to, um, to, to win better protections for workers. They pour millions of money. They are one of the top 10 lobbyists in the country to, you know, fight, you know, everything from the minimum wage to healthcare, right? They were really big uh, opponents of, of, of um, the Affordable Care Act, right, and, you know, so, you know, that's, that's also a challenge, right, because these are really highly organized, you know, industry groups, right, that are really fighting um, for the organizing. Jeff, come here. No, I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I really would love John to talk a little bit about the car wash, because that's an example of immigrant workers really, and the undocumented workers really taking a stand, and this is one of the most um, low and low. I mean, if you ever been to New York City and got your car washed, there's car wash in New York City in an area. There's like 20 people working there, and they're all making three dollars an hour, and they all don't have papers or are undocumented. Um, and that is is that is a breeding ground for abuse. Um, and so I think that it's a breeding ground for abuse. And I think that um, there is a those are really good models and examples of workers actually do taking a stand. And I think that one of the conversations about creative and organizing, if we can take it back to that, is that how do we actually get the new type of worker to take that stand, despite all the things that are happening to them at that moment? Despite the fact that they're coming to this country and they don't have um, the food, <coughs> they, they have to feed a family of four, and they don't have enough money to travel to get to work. They are actually doing it, so the allies and the community organizations are doing their best to support, to support them, to embolden them to do this action. And I think um, that's why the model has a lot, a lot of it has to do with, like, obviously, immigration reform, which is a huge piece to this. You know, legal, legal support, which is how do we actually make sure that the workers are protected, right? So there's all these various different pieces that are surrounded by the actual worker and how we get them. Because at the end of the day, we can create all these models of new media and big coalitions and spend sons of money, but if we can't move a worker on the ground to actually do this, then there is no campaign. There just isn't, right? And you've seen that in a lot of great campaigns where people are saying, we're spending all this money and they can't move 10 workers. And, and so I really do believe it's the conversation around um, the actual conversation on the ground 
and what we're doing to support that worker is what is what you know we should be really thinking about. And I think I kind of want Deb or John to talk about that. Deb, Yeah, I mean, I feel like so in the car wash and the supermarkets also been a lot of undocumented folks, right? Um, and so to some extent, like that creates particular challenges in organizing, and it requires a level of technical expertise to be able to like use our tactics in a smart way and to be able to fight back and anticipate what the boss is gonna use against us. And so I don't want to discount that, right? Like it's helpful to have our lawyers who are really, really skilled at working specifically with the undocumented population. It helps to pull in the AG's <coughs> office to have them sort of in play so that they can help to damper retaliation. Like there's lots of strategies to use. Um, like the, the protections for low-wage workers and undocumented workers are much stronger under wage and hour law than under labor law. Right, and so if you can have, if we want to be able to use some of the legal protections, which are obviously incomplete at best, <coughs> but like it helps to have the wage and hour lawsuit in play, and so that just gives us another angle of pressure. And but on some level, it's like workers decide that they're going to fight the boss if there's a real plan to win, right? And they believe in that plan to win, and so that's what our job is. I feel like we tell the truth to workers. There are specific risks if you're undocumented that really, really suck, um, but there are not actually game-changing, right, as compared to the risks in play for folks who have papers. Um, and so it doesn't, it, and so many of our, you know, like we have this one car wash that's just amazing. It's like the guys are revolutionaries in El Salvador. They, they came here, I mean, they like, they're like, fuck it, deport me if you want, right? Like, just try. Let me see. Like, right? So there are, you know, like I agree. And then it's like people come from backgrounds um, that, and bringing that into play really enables the like the fierceness of a campaign. 